Good morning and welcome to worship this All Saints Sunday at Fondren Presbyterian Church. My name is Rob Lowry. I'm the pastor here at Fondren and it's my joy to welcome you to worship with us this morning. A couple of announcements in the life of the church. As you can see, we are gradually moving into our newly designed chancel. We do have some work going on still on painting and plaster work, so that will be happening through the month of November, but our anticipation is that will be done soon after Thanksgiving, at which time the organ will be reinstalled and our sanctuary will be back to normal, and aren't we glad for that? Also, elders, we have a meeting tonight at 7 o'clock in person in the library. Please do remember that. And don't forget that if you'd like to know more about life here at Fondren, you can visit our website at www.fondrenpcusa.org or sign up for our weekly e-news by emailing the church office, office at fondrenpcusa.org. Now friends, let's gather our hearts and our minds together. We prepare to worship God. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Therefore, let us throw off the sin that encumbers us and worship God. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Therefore, let us throw off the sin that encumbers us and serve one another. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Therefore, let us throw off the sin that encumbers us and run the race before us. Let us worship God, and together let us pray. Good and gracious God, you surround us with a great cloud of witnesses. We give you thanks for their faith and their witness, and we ask, O oh God, that you would draw us ever closer to them and to you. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Friends, it is in Christ's name that we gather. And the name of Christ is the name of forgiveness. 
Because we are God's children, we know that God is indeed forgiving. So in one voice, let us throw off the sin that encumbers us. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbors. And let us know for a moment the great joy that comes from the forgiveness of God. Let us pray. Stir up your spirit in us, Lord, that we may experience the happiness and blessing of being your disciples in more than name only. We are weak, O God, but you, our Lord, are strong. Strengthen us to be people who sing and live your song of love. We are too often unwilling to serve those in need. Give us the strength to willingly serve our neighbors, even those we don't especially like. We often forget justice and mercy. We ask, O oh God, that you would make those watchwords of our lives. May we seek justice and mercy for all and those who truly repent of what is past and look in anticipation for what is yet to come. This we pray in your name and for your sake. Amen. Friends, the proof of God's amazing love is and always has been this, that as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sins from us. Friends, believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please you, O oh God, to speak through the words of this unworthy servant, then speak. And all, this and at all times, speak to us as only you can, in the silence of our hearts. Amen. Our text this morning comes from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, the story of Elijah and the voice of God on a mountainside. Listen now, friends for the word of the Lord. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how he had killed Baal's prophets with the sword. Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah with this message, may the gods do whatever they want to me, if by this time tomorrow, I have not made your life like one of theirs. Elijah was terrified. 
He got up and ran for his life. He arrived at Beersheba in Judah and left his assistant there. He himself went further on into the desert, a day's journey. He finally sat down under a solitary broom bush. He longed for his own death. It's more than enough, Lord. Take my life because I am no better than my ancestors. He lay down and slept beneath that solitary broom bush. Then, suddenly, a messenger tapped him and said to him, Get up, eat something. Elijah opened his eyes and saw flatbread baked on glowing coals and a jar of water by his head. He ate and drank and then went back to sleep. The Lord's messenger returned a second time, tapped him. Get up, the messenger said. Eat something because you have a difficult road ahead of you. Elijah got up, ate and drank and went refreshed by that food for 40 days and 40 nights until he arrived at Horeb, God's mountain. There he went into a cave and he spent the night. The Lord's word came to him and said, why are you here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I've been very passionate for the Lord God of heavenly forces because the Israelites have abandoned your covenant. They have torn down your altars. They have murdered your prophets with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they want to take my life too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. The Lord is passing by. A very strong wind tore through the mountains and broke apart storms, stones before the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord wasn't in the fire. After the, fast, the fire, there was a sound. Thin, quiet. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his coat. He went out and stood at the cave's entrance. A voice came to him and said, Why are you here, Elijah? He said, I've been very passionate for the Lord God of heavenly forces because the Israelites have abandoned your covenant. They have torn down your altars. They have murdered your prophets with a sword. I'm the only one left and now they want to take my life too. The Lord said to him, go back to the desert to Damascus and anoint Hazael as king of Aram. Anoint also Yehu, Nimshi's son, as king of Israel and anoint Elisha from abel Manola, Shaphat's son, to succeed you as prophet. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazael, Yehu will kill. Whoever escapes from the sword of Yehu, Elihu will kill. Elijah will kill. But I have preserved those who remain in Israel, totaling 7,000, all those whose knees haven't bowed down to Baal and whose mouths haven't kissed him. So Elijah departed from there. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the things I like to do when I'm driving by myself is to sing to my music with the sound turned way up. Now, I do that for a couple of reasons. First, I do it because I love the music. And second, I do it because with the music turned up really loud, I can't hear myself singing. I am many things in this life, but an undiscovered vocal genius is not one of them. On Friday, as I was on my way to Tupelo for a funeral, I was driving along the trace, listening to my music, singing along as I often do. Now, if you've ever driven the trace from Jackson to Tupelo, you know there are places along the route where you begin to lose cell service. And there are a couple of places where it drops out altogether. 
Well, I was listening to my music on my phone. When I hit one of those dead spots and the music abruptly stopped. Now, because my voice is what it is when I sing, when the music stops, I usually stop too. So as I was driving and the music fell off, a couple of beats later, I was silent, and the only sound in my car was the white noise in the background of the tires on the pavement. Now Friday, if you recall, was a pretty overcast day. There was no wind. It was one of those days that feels and looks quiet. The contrast between my music and my singing one moment and the near silence in the cab of my truck the next was palpable. Now, Elijah was not singing at the top of his lungs along with George Strait on the Natchez Trace, but the shift from the whipping wind and the sound of earthquakes and the raging fires to the quiet must have been even more jarring for him that day. This text from 1 Kings 19 about Elijah on the mountainside and the still small voice is one that many of us know. It is, in fact, the first text I ever translated from Hebrew in seminary. It was one of my professor's favorite texts, and he delighted in getting students to take their first deep dive in the language in this rich story. The Hebrew itself is pretty straightforward. There are a couple of little potholes you have to look out for, but for the most part, it's a straightforward translation project, except for one part. We know that part most famously as the still small voice. That's the translation most of us grew up with, the still small voice. Our text today translates it as a sound, quiet, silent. Either way, God was not present in the earthquake. God was not present in the wind. God was not present in the fire. God was present in the still small voice that comes to Elijah. Now, still small voice is not an entirely bad translation of the Hebrew there, and neither is the one our text gave us today. But neither one, I think, really captured entirely the emotion of what's being said there. The best translation I have heard of this text, and by best, I mean the one I'm going to choose to use this morning, came from one of my professors who translated it as the sound of sheer silence. The sound of sheer silence. Nothing like an oxymoron to try to clear up a theological problem, right? We might as well go ahead and call this jumbo shrimp or enjoyable committee work or the joy of politics. The sound of sheer silence. Admittedly, as a phrase, it doesn't make much sense. But still, I would wager that at one point or another, all of us have heard it in all of its paradoxical reality. We have all heard the sound of sheer silence. A few years ago, when a friend of mine lost his wife to breast cancer, he told me that not long after, he would go to bed every night leaving the TV on in their den. It wasn't that he was afraid in the house by himself or afraid to go to bed without the TV on. He said he just couldn't get past the sound of the silence in the house every night. He said the silence without her there was too much to bear. For many of us, that is the sound of sheer silence we experience in this life. That moment when we pick up the phone to call or walk in the next room to find that friend or loved one who is no longer there. In that silence, the world is quieter than it could ever possibly be. And yet in that moment, the silence 
surrounds us just like a clanging fire alarm. Perhaps that's why the compilers of this narrative lectionary put this text on this day. Today is All Saints Sunday, the day we remember the lives of those we have lost since last year's All Saints. And perhaps this text about the sheer silence is here to remind us that their voices are somehow gone from our midst. Considering that last year on this date we had no names to read and this year we have so many who were loved, admired, and cared for in this church. Those who worshipped and worked alongside all of us. The sheer silence today is nearly deafening. Where we wish and hope to hear the voices of loved ones, we often only hear that sound of sheer silence. Standing on the mountainside, Elijah listened attentively for the voice of God whom he knew and he loved. The prophet was no fool and a student of his own traditions and knew that when God chose to speak, it was often through nature. So he tuned his ear to that nature that surrounded him on the mountainside. And the text tells us that nature began to speak. First in the wind, but the Lord was not in the wind. Then after in the earthquake, the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then in the fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And then after the fire, there was silence. The sound of sheer silence. And only then did Elijah hear the presence of the Lord. In the sound of this year's silence, his ears were opened to the voice of the Lord. Early in my career, I confess I was not a fan of this Sunday. In my youth and inexperience, I thought that this day was nothing more than dragging up painful memories best left in the past. It seemed like one of those church days we had held on to for just a bit too long. Now, however, after a few more years of ministry or in my wake and with the experience that only life can give us, I've come to understand this day of remembrance as an important reminder of how the church of Jesus Christ works in the world. You see, the church of Jesus Christ is more than the mere momentary gathering of a group of people saying prayers and reading scripture in normal times, at least singing hymns. The church of Jesus Christ transcends place. It goes beyond these walls. It embraces and includes the community around us that we serve, our partners in ministry, and all those with whom we would share the love and the joy of Christ. But it's not merely walls that the church of Jesus Christ transgresses. The church is also no respecter of time. Past, present, and future have no real role in the church because they are not separate things, but instead are all the possession of the one we worship, the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. All time, time that has been lived, time that we are living, and the time yet to be lived is held together in the arms and the love of God. And because God, God's self, is not constrained by time or place, the same is true for those of us who are part of the body of Christ, both in this place and as part of the church triumphant. To the wisdom of the faith of those who have gone before us is not gone from our midst. Instead, it echoes beyond their years in the sound of the sheer silence. Or to put it another way, their voices can still be heard in the hush of the holy in this place. The voices and the lives of those who shaped 
so many of us in our faith who helped build this church into what it is today, who shared their discernment, their insight, their wisdom, through the, though their absence certainly feels like a loss in our hearts, in death they are anything but lost. See, friends, if we tune our ears to the hush of the holy in this place, we can still hear their lives echoing around us. If we tune our ears to the hush of the holy, we may yet hear the whispers of Moody McDill encouraging us to be a church more attentive to equality and justice. We may hear Mary Brooks reminding us of the importance of public education and the importance of putting things back in the kitchen where they belong. We may hear Elise Winter speaking from her bully pulpit as our state's first lady standing up for prisoners and working for fair housing in Jackson. If we listen closely enough, we might even hear the two Carolines down the hall having a conversation in the library. You see, in all the voices of the faithful, there is a place in this place. All the voices of the faithful who have walked these halls, sat in these pews, sung these hymns, and shared this faith are present with us even now. Though they may not be present with us in the way we are used to having them, their wisdom and their faith and their love is here with us in the hush of the holy of this place. Although we're not singing hymns right now, there is great wisdom of the saints to be learned through what is, I think, one of the best hymns in our hymnal. For all the saints who from their labors rest, who by faith to all the world confessed, thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia indeed. Thanks today and every day be to God for all the saints whose voices have joined the great cloud of witnesses who are with us even now in the sound of sheer silence and the hush of the holy in this place and who are with us evermore in the ever-growing chorus of the Church of Jesus Christ, a voice that transcends place and time and lives in the promise of resurrection and new life. Thanks be to God for their voices here in the household of God. Amen.
O God who grants us life and God who grants us rest, we give you thanks for your children who have come before us, bearing the light of your word through the centuries into our time and place. As we dwell in the land of the shadow of death, we seek your guidance and your comfort. O God who lived and walked the way of death on earth, we ask for your healing, anticipate your warmth, and await the coming dawn. We give you thanks for those who have come before us and walked beside us, following in your way. For James Merrill Bateman. William Forrest Winter. David Myers Morris. Carolyn Sutton Birch. Marjorie Hess Morris. Carolyn Fay Caldwell White. Diane Weaver Blankenhorn. Elise Varner Winter. Jeanette Blockman. And for those whose names are known only in the silence of those who mourn them. O God of every age, of our first breath and our last, may we find consolation in your promise of new life and in the understanding that love in this world is from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. Friends, go down into the world as love and serve the Lord with gladness and with singleness of heart. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the everlasting companionship of the Holy Spirit be with us and keep us in this and in every day. And in one voice, may all God's children in every time and every place say, Amen.